By exploring our previous exercises, you've learned some essential tools and workflows in Illustrator. In our Euclid exercise you learned how to work with geometric shapes, create straight lines with the pen tool, and use keyboard tricks like Option plus Shift to constrain proportions when scaling. In the Line Art exercise, you learned how to place a bitmap image, embed it, and use an object to create a clipping mask. You used the paintbrush tool to draw curving shapes and took a dive into the various pen tools, using them to generate and modify busy A curves. With some inspiration from Bauhaus master Paul Clay, you learned advanced line and brush techniques such as working with the blend tool and creating custom art and scattered brushes. In our color relativity exercise, you learned how to work with color fills to create spatial illusion and shifts in color identity. This video builds on those experiences. Because you're now more comfortable in Illustrator, we won't introduce these tools in tutorial format. We'll just do a demo so you'll become familiar enough with them that you can choose to use them in whatever manner is appropriate for your modular artwork. With that said, you can download the demo file from the wiki and test drive some or all of these tools. Look for and open the file called advanced underscore tools AI and set your workspace to essentials classic. There is a layer in the file called your turn with some generic shapes that you can use to play with these techniques. Finally, we'll show you a special workflow that's super useful for quickly and precisely creating the concentric scaling and rotational symmetry that defines a mandala. Gradients are fills that contain a combination of more than one color. If you look in the swatches palette, you'll see a few default gradients. If we unlock the sample layer and select the square labeled linear gradient, we'll see a black and white gradient appear in the fill in the options bar, and also in the tool palette. Look just below that fill icon, and you'll see a little gradient icon next to the none icon. Click on that gradient icon to bring up the gradient palette. Take some time to play around with the variables. You can reverse the direction of the gradient by clicking on the reverse gradient icon. Change the shape of the gradient from linear to radial to freeform. If you click on the freeform icon or hit the edit gradient button, this will call up the gradient tool. When the gradient tool is selected, you'll see how the gradient is defined live in the shape, as well as in the gradient palette. Notice on both there are circles which function like handles. Inside the circle is a defining color. If you want to change the color defined at that point, double click on the circle and edit the color in the pop-up. While the circle is selected, Notice that you can also define the opacity of the color, as well as moving its location along the bar. You can use an eyedropper tool to pick up another color from inside your composition. While you're looking at the gradient bar, notice the small diamond shape set midway between two handles. This sets the midpoint of the gradient. Click, hold and drag the diamond to create an offset to this midpoint. In the case of choosing a radial gradient, you can set its aspect ratio at 100% for circular or other aspects to create horizontal or vertical elliptical gradients. These can also be rotated. Finally, playing with the new freeform editor is fun. You can generate points that define colors, set a radius for their influence, and create opacity levels for highly complex multidirectional gradients. Next up is Blend, a tool you will remember from the Line Art exercise. It can also be used to create gradient-like color effects. Turning off the sample layer, let's take the red square and the cyan circle in the return layer, select them, and apply a blend from the menu, Object, Blend, Make. The result looks like a gradient, but hit Command plus Y to enter outline mode and you'll see the blend is just defined by a vector line connecting the midpoints of the two shapes. This vector line can be edited using the Direct Selection tool and the Anchor Point tool to create a curving vector. Notice how the blend changes when we curve it. Now, let's move one of the shapes and notice how the blend follows it around. Scale the shape and see how that affects the blend. Rotate the square and observe the change. Blends are cool. But they get cooler. Let's go to the menu, Object, Blend, Blend Options and change the spacing option from Smooth Color to Specified Steps. We'll enter 3 in the field that's enabled and we'll use the Align to Path option. Now apply or blend between the green circle and purple triangle. Use the Direct Selection tool and the Anchor Point tool to create a busy A curve at the handle in the circle and see how this blend changes. Apply the same specified steps to the blue triangle and yellow square, but this time we'll do something very interesting. With this new blend created, go to Menu, Object, Blend, Expand, and the blend vector turns into a group of actual shapes with actual fills. Ungroup these and you have some fun new things to play with. Incidentally, if you are having a hard time figuring out how two colors mix like you did in the color exercise, the expand trick is a great way to find it. The middle figure here, 
for example, turns out to be a middle value gray tone, because the two extreme colors are pure complements of each other. Deform tools are found about halfway down the toolbar palette. Hiding under the width tool are deformers like warp, swirl, pucker and others that you can see in the sample layer. We'll come back to width later, but let's play around with a couple of these. After this demo you can go in and play with more since they all behave more or less the same. Let's just start by turning off the sample layer and using one of the circles under the return layer to perform a scallop. Double click on the scallop tool to open the dialog box and notice the defaults. The global brush dimensions will set the parameters for all of the deform tools, and there are specific parameters dealing with the scallop alone. The global controls are fairly intuitive, but when I get to intensity, I tend to drive the percentage down to the 5 or 10% range and then simply hold the tool down longer when I activate it. The default tends to apply the deform in a rather aggressive way otherwise. Me, I like control. So, setting the intensity around 10%, apply scallop to a circle. It creates a sunburst effect pushing inward. Next, switch to the crystallize tool which works as a kind of inverse to the scallop deformer. Apply three short bursts and you get a random explosive effect. Finally, Move to the twirl tool and give it a quick click for a dynamic, spiral burst effect. Applying a fill color and a different stroke color enhances the dynamism. The weight tool is the one deformer that behaves differently. It only works on strokes, but this is a great effect for generating non-uniform line weight. Just click and drag on a selected stroke. The tool creates a handle and a perpendicular width controller that you can set and adjust. Psychedelic. Path modification allows you to simplify many complex drawing tasks by starting with a simple vector path. The sample layer shows you the results of offset, reversing, and simplifying paths while also showing you various manipulations of stroke. It shows you a join function for an open path as well as adding and removing anchor points. Finally, you can turn a stroke into outlines, just like you learned to do with type, and the divide and clipping path function are useful as well. Turn off the sample layer and turn on the return layer. Select the first square and go to Menu, Object, Path, Offset Path. In the dialog box you can turn on a preview to see what you get. Positive number offsets will expand. Negative numbers will contract. Keeping the number the same and repeating the offset on the new object will create nested, concentric shapes. Select all the offset objects and head to the stroke palette. Here you can change the line weight, the behavior of corner monitors, and you can even create dashes. Changing the line profile creates a complex effect. Select another square and apply an eccentric charcoal style line definition to it. Under Menu, Object, Path, Reverse Direction, you can see the obvious utility of this effect. Select the third square and apply Menu, Object, Path, Simplify to open a dialog box. Check the Preview button and play with the sliders to see how this changes a rigid geometry into a looser, sketchy line. You'll see this is taking the corner anchors and changing them to busy A curves if you select one of the corners with a direct selection tool. Often you'll have an open path you need to join the end anchors for, and this is where the join function is useful. Select the incomplete circle, and with the direct selection tool, select the two end anchors. Go to Menu, Object, Path, Join, and you'll see the path complete itself. Adding anchor points basically doubles the number of anchors. Direct select an anchor and go to Menu, Object, Path, Delete Anchor Points, to reduce anchors on a closed path, it's similar to the Delete Anchor Pen tool. Select a triangle and apply a really thick stroke, then go to Menu, Object, Path, Outline Stroke. This is a cool effect because now the stroke color is a fill, and you can apply a stroke to it. Divide Objects functions a bit like the Pathfinder tool you used in the Blackbird project. Select one object, though, then apply Menu, Object, Arrange, Bring to Front, then apply Menu, Object, Path, Divide Objects. The top object disappears, but not before it slices the object below in accordance with the outline that overlapped it. These objects are not grouped. We created a clipping mask in the line art exercise, but here's a cool thing. Clipping masks don't have to be rectangles, they can be any shape. Look for the JPEG image in the Advanced Tools download folder and place it into the Illustrator file. Then apply Menu, Object, Arrange, Send to Back, so the vector triangle is visible. Position the eye at the top of the pyramid in the triangle. Then, with the image and the triangle selected, go to Menu, Object, Clipping Mask, Make, and... <laughs> If you ever need to release a clipping mask, select the object and go to Menu, Object, Clipping Mask, Release, and
Well, still Illuminati, but unmask at last. Effects are a bit like the Distort tools, in that there's too much to show in a short demo, but the filters function similarly enough in workflow that we'll just cherry-pick through some of the examples seen in the Advanced Tools file. Peruse the Effects menu and you'll see some effects that are native to Illustrator, while others are familiar to users of Photoshop. The top row of squares in the file features Illustrator effects for 3D, shape conversion, and distorts. The middle row is a mixture, and the bottom row is purely Photoshop effects. We will point out some of the highlights, but we'll encourage you to use the advanced tools file to play more fully with these effects. Turn off the sample layer and activate the return layer, then select the upper square to create a 3D extrude and bevel from the effects menu. Check the preview button in the dialog box and change a couple of the variables like the rotation angles or the extrude depth. Give this a bit of time for the processor to catch up. All the 3D functions work in a similar manner. Use Menu, Effect, Convert to Shape, Rounded Rectangle, and, like the 3D effect, check the Preview button and play with the variables like Corner Radius. All Convert to Shape functions are available in this one dialog. Use the Distort and Transform functions under Effects to create distortions very similar to those created by the Distort tools from the toolbar, although you will notice these are much more precisely applied than those created using Distort tools. Use the Twist feature, for example, to create a uniform 60-degree twist affecting all corners equally. Compare that to the more intuitive, randomized results you can get with the Twist tool. Features under Stylize, like Drop Shadow, all run with a similar dialog box. Play with the variables here to affect color of shadow, depth, offset and the like, using the preview checkbox to see. For Photoshop effects it's really best to use the Effects Gallery option. Most of the effects are here, and you can set variables for each one quickly. Here we'll apply a brush strokes, spatter, and dial up the radius to see a grainy edge effect. Be careful using too many effects, however, they are processor intensive, and can slow down the rendering of your image if you go too far. Here, we'll finish with a Gaussian blur, a nice effect one doesn't see in the effects gallery, and one not usually associated with sharp edge vector graphics. Watch how you can create an almost airbrush effect with the preview checked on and a high pixel radius. Our final demo is a workflow combining rotation and scaling with Command plus D, the Transform Again Key command. It's a powerful workflow for mandala generation. The results are viewable in the samples layer. Turn it off and select the triangle in the return layer. When you turn on the guides, notice the presence of crossing guides in the middle of the gray field. Make sure your snap to grid and snap to point are on. Select the shape. Select the rotate tool once, and use option plus click to set the center at the guide intersection. This opens a dialog box. Fill in the angle field with the angle you wish to rotate. For a hexagon-based structural geometry, the math is easy enough, but there's a cool trick you can do in this box. It will do math for you. Simply type in the number 360, the number of degrees in a circle, then divide it by the number of times you want to divide the circle. For a hexagon, it will be slash over 6, but you could do crazy numbers like slash over 7 or slash over 13 and it will calculate these complex non-whole number angles. Once you fill in the field with 360 over 6, hit the copy button, and it will copy the triangle 60 degrees up and to the right. But now the magic happens. Hit Command plus D and the program will repeat the action, creating the third triangle. Keep hitting Command plus D and the program will keep rotating copies of the triangles in precise 60 degree increments around the center. Now, scale the objects inward. Select all the objects and perform a paste in front, hitting Command plus C to copy then Command plus F to paste. It looks like nothing happens because you have pasted copies exactly on top of themselves. This will allow you to preview the scaling better. Next, select the scale tool once, then hit Option plus click to set the center of the scaling operation, and this pops open the dialog. Set the scale percentage uniformly, then toggle the preview checkbox to see it. When satisfied, hit the copy button. Hit Command plus D to keep scaling inward proportionally. The final step is to return back to the paste in front objects, shift select all of them, and delete. Use this rotate and scale with transform again workflow and you can see how a seemingly complex drawing can be done rather simply. Just by taking this one element, rotating and scaling it, then randomly changing things like color, it looks like I've taken real effort to do a drawing that actually just took a couple of minutes to make. So that's our tour of many useful advanced tools in Illustrator. You shouldn't feel obligated to use every tool you saw here, but you should seek out the right places in your artwork to take advantage of some of them.